سبيل الدموع سبيل مريح تنهد يا صاحي كي تستريح وبث الدعاء الخفي الصريح الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I've had a number of requests over, I'd say, the last sort of several months with respect to the topic which I'm going to discuss uh, today, which is the sound understanding of this concept of al-wala wal-bara. And uh, it's a concept which uh, is becoming more in the public domain because of certain groups that are pushing its understanding and pushing its acceptance amongst what you would consider to be um, the average Muslim. Um, but then you might say, well, why have I now, if I've been getting these requests over a several month period, decided now to sort of sit down and, and, and speak about this topic, or at least research some, put some material in front of you about this topic. Uh, I very recently received uh, from a gentleman um, a request in which he put in writing uh, and I'll share some of the his thoughts uh, with you uh, and this is is an example really of, of, of what's going on particularly within Western Europe uh, but I can assume that it's also going on uh, within the Muslim world obviously being European we are more aware of it uh, from our perspective and he he starts um, I'm just gonna pick up parts of, of his discussion and he says, Oh dear scholars of Islamic knowledge, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is my humble suggestion for a video series. Uh, he did use the word refutation uh, to refute, um, but I think sometimes that language can be uh, misunderstood or become slightly emotionally tainted. And then rather than looking at things uh, objectively, uh, people start to. Uh, challenge things from an emotional background. So he's suggesting a series that I hope you will agree to conduct on a number of issues um, that this takfiri sect in particular is making takfir upon Muslims. Takfir uh, means to declare somebody else as a non-Muslim. That, that's what it's about. Um, and takfir can only be applied to somebody who was a Muslim. So somebody has to be a Muslim for an individual, for a body of scholars to say then this person is no longer a Muslim. It's irrelevant. Nobody issues a, a fatwa or edict of takfir on somebody who was never a Muslim in the first place. It's, it's really pointless. It's uh, not sensible. But the whole concept of takfir has not existed um, very much so in our sort of immediate, yes, you can find examples of it, absolutely. Uh, but what you'll find that it's not the path that's been adopted um, by the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah uh, to randomly and to go around making takfir of, of individuals. But he, he said that this, it says it's deceiving the Muslim youth, it's tearing up Muslim families, and um, it's, by doing this, it's scaring uh, non-Muslims away. It's also bringing a rift between Muslims and non-Muslims. And I hope that I'll be able to convince you to take this task up, inshallah, either by yourself or in cooperation with fellow scholars. So he then goes into great detail explaining what he would like to list together and his main points. Um, I said it's a very detailed uh, uh, request, you know, and this, this is really one of the reasons behind uh, me sitting down here and obviously reading up on the topic first and then sitting down here to share my findings with you. Uh, I do have a very busy schedule and for those of you who will know, uh, we're just about launching our, um, oh, can you remember the title now, uh, concise, comprehensive, corroborated Hanafi fiqh. And we were just about to sort of launch that and, and I was going to dedicate a significant amount of my time in that area, both writing as well as speaking. Um, but because this is, you know, the brothers put so much time and energy uh, to, to request, I, I only felt obliged uh, to at least, you know, put some time to it myself. Um, there's other bits that I can sort of pick up. Um, 
for example, uh, this brother himself, this brother's from uh, Germany, and um, he himself has, is tasting this firsthand. Um, my own brother now, he say, has become a massive uh, takfiri. At one point, he only considered himself to be the only Muslim on the surface of the earth. So you can see the effect of this that it can have on, on vulnerable individuals and how it can make them think in this, in this way. So even before I started my research, or even before I started to share my research with you, you're beginning to get an idea of this kind of hate ideology, this uh, showing disgust towards non-Muslims for the fact that they're not Muslim, and then showing disgust to Muslims because they're not Muslim enough. So this seems to be, he says, you know, at one point he said that the rest of the Ummah were also uh, kafir in his eyes. Uh, they, him and his companions and colleagues would make takfir of ulama like Imam Qurtubi, Imam Nawawi, and some even of Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, rahimahumullah ta'ala. And obviously this is very dangerous and very degrading. Uh, he says, he's tried many things. I've tried to stop talking to my brother. I've explained to him patiently. I've tried many different things. Uh, sometimes I give up, sometimes it ends up being a physical fight. He says, we need your help. Um, my brother's a divorced adult, has no job, no money, no place to stay other than his parents' home. So this is not, is, is, is giving him a very closed mindset of the world. Uh, I have discussed other things with him, which I can't share here uh, as to what else could be the issues that he needs to look at. But our job is to look at this uh, uh, ideology. Um, he criticizes the feeling of insincerity. He sort of criticizes when he hears ayats and hadith. Uh, he, they are sort of picking them and bringing themselves their own understanding of these verses. This is no small matter, he says. Uh, it's a matter of going astray and leading others astray. It's a, master, a matter of justification of hatred and violence towards Muslims and innocent non-Muslims. It's bringing a major division amongst Muslims and it gets young people to do takfir of their own parents and siblings and it destroys families. Parents are suffering because of this and nobody help, helps them. I'm a witness to that. So it's a very impassioned plea. Uh, this is a matter that causes the Islamic justification of terrorist attacks against civil civilians, um, causes young people to carry out suicide bombings, and they actually think that Islam allows them to do so. It's a matter that leads to the worst kind of disrespect against our elders and against our scholars of past and present. Um, how is this a small matter, he asks. For Allah's sake, I ask you for help. And this is in bold. Um, so it's, you know, it was a very impassioned plea. Um, I did say that I, I've got more than enough on my plate to be dealing with at the moment. Um, but it's very difficult for someone uh, to turn away a fellow brother, a fellow Muslim, uh, who's going through this. And I'm sure he's not the only one. Um, and people may say, well, you know, uh, this is not our job if people are carrying out criminal activities and isn't that the job of the government? Uh, isn't that the job of the police? Um, that's fine. Any criminal act which is carried out, the police are dealing with it and will deal with it. Uh, and as will the government. But that's not our concern and that's not really our responsibility. As scholars or as students of the Sharia, our responsibility is to make sure that this religion of Islam is not twisted beyond whether that's ifrat or tafrit, whether that's extremism in the case where the religion is diluted away completely uh, until nothing exists whatsoever and it's completely washed away or vice versa whether it's misinterpreted um, it's uh, a, a twisted ideology based upon uh, misinterpreting verses of the Quran and ahadith or taking them out of context so that's what that's the pretext um, to what will be, I'm not sure how long uh, this will this will take um, because I've not sort of timed myself as such. But I'm hoping that it doesn't go beyond two hours. Um, that's my target. Uh, but what I will do is um, I will get the uh, editor to sort of split it into uh, uh, manageable chunks, maybe sort of half an hour chunks. Now there's many. Um, books available on this concept of al-wala wal-bara which comes from and is termed the aqidah of the salaf uh, even though it's it's not the aqidah of the salaf it's given that impression uh, there's one which is a now an english translation of a book uh, by sheikh muhammad sayyid al-qahtani uh, which is available 
Uh, it's a three-volume book. Uh, I managed to get hold of it online. You can get it in the English version. And this lays out the <clears throat> ideology that um, this young man is talking about uh, with respect to this concept of al-wala wal-bara. And if I just touch upon it so we can hear it straight from the author, um, we can, I'm just going to just mention some bits to it. Um, the book was originally a thesis for a master's degree in the Department of Aqidah of the Ummul Qura University in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. And um, this was uh, sort of submitted uh, in 1401, uh, which is about sort of nearly 40 years ago now. So it's, it, is, it is quite dated in it, the, the fact it's been around. If you just catch up, up, up in the foreword, uh, the foreword is put by Sheikh Abdul Razak Al Afifi, and he writes um, The subject matter of this work is of paramount importance and utmost interest for two major reasons. He says, firstly, it is concerned with one of Islam's main foundations, namely the qualities of Al Wala Wal Bara. So this is interesting in that this has been raised a political understanding. Uh, or put a potential political understanding has been inserted within a belief system. And these are two major prerequisites of true faith. So this is now a definition of true faith. That these are prerequisites, meaning if you do not abide by the concept of al-wala wal-bara, then you can potentially be considered as a non-Muslim. Well, not potentially, you will be a non-Muslim. Now, we will obviously need to define this, and I'm not, I'm not going to explain to you al wala wal bara you know if i was to give it a one word the and as i explained to my students as well it's very difficult to take arabic words especially technical terms and then just give them one english meaning and then that's it will walk off because what happens with students and what happens with people who are listening is they then always think that whenever they hear that word it's always going to be this meaning and arabic is so um multifaceted in terms of its meaning because it's, the context plays such a huge uh, impact on it and because it's a very poetic language uh, it can also um, it, it's the the kind of metaphorical allegorical figurative meaning which can be used as well exists so let's you know because we always like um, English words uh, al wala uh, will be broadly something on the longer terms of loyalty and bara will be broadly in the terms of being non-loyal so you know disavowal uh, i guess uh, is, is a, a reasonable uh, uh word translation but i'm i've used that once so i'm not going to use it again uh let's stick to these terms because as soon as you say that uh, then the english m m words have an implication so but i just did that for the sake here at this stage at this juncture but further on i will not do so um Al-Wala, he defines it, he says, Al-Wala is a manifestation of sincere love for Allah, his prophets and the believers. And Al-Bara is an expression of enmity and hatred towards falsehood and its adherence. And this is interesting, Al-Bala is, Al-Bara rather, Al-Bala. Al-Bara is an expression of enmity and hatred towards falsehood and its adherence, both are evidence of Iman. Uh, and then he says, secondly, it's been written at a very crucial time. Everything has become so mixed up that some Muslims are no longer aware of those qualities which distinguish the believers from the non-believers. Their faith has become so weak that they've adopted patterns of behavior that are absolutely repug repugnant uh, to a sincere believer. They have taken the disbelievers as their friends while displaying enmity towards many of the believers by disparaging their character and degrading them. So quite emotive and quite strong terms there. And then he sort of speaks well of the author in terms of what he's writing. Uh, and I'll allow, you know, I'm, I've, I've shown you these texts so that you, you know, you can see. I'm not trying to hide anything from you uh, and be picky and choosy out of what I'm sharing and not sharing with you. The only thing I'm sharing with you is because of the relevance of it. And I'm not really going to go through the whole text with you. But you've got the text, you know, Al-Wala Wal-Bara, according to the Aqidah of the Salaf, part 1, 2 and 3 by Muhammad Al-Qahtani. Um... And this is an English version which has been translated. It does mention that somewhere uh, that some uh, converts have uh, translated this. Um, where are we there? There. Thanks also due to Omar Johnston for translating the book into English, to Ahmed Thompson for editing and typesetting the text and compiling the glossary, and to Yusuf Islam for both his moral and financial support in its publication. So that's how he's reached uh, the English version. So we then find, um, there's no page numbers on here, but... Uh, when we're now on the uh, uh, preface to the first edition, 
uh, just on the other page, it says, this great word, Tawheed, with all the meanings and requirements it entails, has been absent in people's life except a few. So you're already seeing now that um, the way this is starting is suggesting that only a few of Muslims are actually upon deen and the great majority are not. One of the most important, and there it goes, one of the most important subject of these requirements is the doctrine of al-wala wal-bara. However, although this crucial principle of faith has vanished from people's lives, it does not, I, I'm, I'm sort of changing bits of it because obviously there's some errors in, in its translation or, or in the editing. Uh, it's using singulars in place of duals, uh, sorry, in, pl in place of plurals. It does not change a thing about its plain reality. The doctrine of al-wala wal-bara is the real image for the actual practice of this faith. So what it's saying is that the aqidah, the belief system which comes into practice has to, can only be through this al-wala wal-bara. Um, it has a tremendous significance in the mind of the Muslims as much as the greatness and significance of the faith. Therefore, Tawheed will never be achieved on earth until we apply the doctrine of al-wala wal-bara and some people think that the principle of faith is a matter of secondary importance, but in reality it is opposite. So you're seeing a lot of conflation between al-wala wal-bara and then suddenly substituting al-wala wal-bara with the word faith. So saying, oh, people think faith is not a big issue, assuming that al-wala wal-bara as being determined by, by, by Muhammad al-Qahtani and all the others of the, uh, uh, which would be the Salafis, um, because this mentions this is a, a Salafi group uh, that are working on this that they're um, uh, They're conflating this al wala wal bara with faith and then substituting it as in where as in when in order to get uh, uh, This assumption you get this point across that what you're dropping is something serious. There's some verses quoted um, But you know my job is not necessarily to go through this whole text I'm just going to touch on this last bit and then I'll explain why I'm not going to go through this last text, go through this text. These issues are raised because the real meaning and application of Tawheed is absent from everyday life of Muslims. So that's not some Muslims, that's not one or two Muslims, that's not maybe a few Muslims. This is saying of Muslims. It's absent, meaning you're not really a Muslim yet. It is so distorted that so many people think that the confirmation of Rububiya, which is the unity of Lordship, is enough for them to become Wahidun. Wahidun is being monotheist, without having to confirm Uluhiya, the unity of worship, uh, or the div divine, divine nature of worship. And, and this is another very relatively new concept. A very relatively new concept. This concept of uh, Rububiya and Uluhiya and al asma wa sifat uh, some aren't obviously if you look at the maturidi and the ash'ari and the athari you'll see that many of these things were discussed centuries ago but they weren't discussed in this way this is relatively new we're talking about maybe a, a century or so at best a uh, real tawheed now here you see in another definite real tawheed meaning there's a tawheed which is not real and there's a tawheed which is real meaning what everybody else is following is not real tawheed what that basically means is that they're not proper muslims real tawheed consists of the unity of lordship and the unity of worship it is part of the doctrine of al wala wal bara so who was the sort of founder of this well we find out here may allah have mercy upon sheikh muhammad ibn abdul wahhab so sheikh muhammad ibn abdul wahhab was the sort of founder of this concept uh, which is referred to as the Salafi sect, who said, The Islam of a man can never be accepted, even if he abandons polytheism, unless he shows enmity towards the disbelievers and polytheists, as Allah SWT says in Surah Al-Mujadila, uh, verse 22. So if we find uh, Surah Al-Mujadila, verse 22. Okay, where are we? Yep, so Surah Mujadala. Okay. Here we have it, and verse 22, and let's read the Arabic first. So, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Let me just go central to the screen again before I end up falling off the screen. Um, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim La tajidu qawma yu'minu billahi wal yawm al-akhri yuwaaduna man haadu Allah wa rasuluhu walau kanu abaahum aw abnaahum aw ikhwanahum aw ashiratahum You will not find uh, a people yu'minuna who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wal yawm al-akhir and in the last day yuwaduna wad wad showing love 
to whom man had Allah to those who had oppose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger Walaukan, even if they be abaahum their fathers or abnaahum or their sons or ikhwanahum or their brothers or ashiratahum or their uh, sort of extended family their tribes ulaika kataba fi qulubihim al iman wa ayyadahum bi ruhin minh wa yudkhiluhum jannatin tajri min tahtiha al anhar khalidin fiha radiyallahu anhum wa radu an ulaika hizbullah ala inna hizballah hum al muflihun so this, but the rest of it is not quoted by uh, um, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. It's only this part which is quoted. So this verse is used then as a way of determining the, uh, or used to decide who is a believer, who is not a believer. This verse is used. So this verse is taken. You can clearly see it's been referenced here. Um, the book that it's been referenced from is Majmu'at al-Tawheed on page 19 uh, in which um, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab has mentioned this ayat and when he mentioned this ayat he's saying Islam of a man can never be accepted meaning, so let's put this in another word, in other words a person is not a Muslim that's what is being said here uh, even if he abandons polytheism unless he shows enmity towards the disbelievers and polytheists. So enmity is actually now part of faith. That's what it's referring to, as Allah SWT said in this uh, verse here. And um, he then finishes off this forward, um, or this preface rather, and this is Muhammad ibn Sayyid uh, ibn Salim al Kahtani. He does this in 1402 Hijri. And the last point before I stop is in order to approach the subject of al-wala wal bara from a correct Islamic perspective we should consider three fundamental points firstly the essence of Islam is contained in the words la ilaha illallah uh, Muhammad Rasulullah that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah secondly so the belief is now split into three secondly there is al-wala wal bara which are essential elements relating to this declaration of faith and thirdly shirk hypocrisy, apostasy, and disbelief all contradict this declaration of faith. So we are now have a somewhat um, kind of conditions or criteria applied to La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Whereas before, when somebody said La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, it was accepted that this person is a Muslim and we see many examples of this in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, in which individuals have professed that and even though they've done acts contrary to that or they've done that in order to get out of a sticky moment uh, their iman is accepted on face value we've got so many uh, examples of that and we will be able to share with you now I'm not going to proceed and refute because I did say uh, even though the brother requested a refutation, that's not the road I'm going to go down because I want people to be able to listen to what I'm saying uh, with a clear mind rather than think, uh, oh, you know, he's, and, and you're going to get an emotional response and then, you know, this is going to run like five series of responses. You know, somebody's going to respond to me, I'm going to respond to them and, you know, that's it. What I thought would just be a few, uh, you know, a few days worth of uh, my time is going to end up, you know, becoming my my life basically so i'm not going to go through that and i could you know arguably like in that way i've not even that, that, that last point i raised with you was from chapter one i've just done that from the forward and i could have done that through the three volumes and taken that approach but that's not the approach i'm going to take uh, so i'm going to put that to one side now um there are responses to this there's many responses there's many work going on and there's one particular response uh, that i managed to dig you know there's a lot of things you've got to read uh, which is the uh, um i'm sure you can catch that on the screen uh, which is the roots of religious extremism understanding the salafi doctrine of al wala wal bara and this is in the imperial college muhammad ibn ali and has written this uh this it probably be a research project, I'm not sure if it was a, a thesis of sorts, um, in which it's been put together and um, where he's looked into this whole topic and uh, this research and uh, he's done a, a very good job on it, if, if, uh, if, uh, if I can say. And he's analysed this in great detail. Again, I'm not going to share anything from here either. Um, this is available. Um, so it's something which you can uh, get for yourselves and, and, and research into. So I'm going to leave that to one side.